Welcome to Clickbait the video, featuring, well, you guys. I am trying to figure out this Discord thing because these telegraphic conversations we're having via YouTube comments, they have their pen pally charm, I suppose. But man, I miss the days of talking about video games at the park while I was waiting for my team's turn to jump into the public footy 5 court on a Sunday morning. But for now, the best thing I can do is make a video to recap some of the stuff that you have said in the comment section that made me feel like I should dust off the good old right of reply. And let's start with a video on tyranny. And let's start with Manolios, who says, I have a small objection with the review. The game is not medieval inspired. Both art style and lore resemble the pre-classical East Mediterranean world. The art style gives me serious vibes of archaic art such as the Minoan. Smooth curves, lively colors with high contrast and symmetrical geometric designs. Furthermore, people are transitioning from bronze tools and weapons to iron ones. The Empire holds the secret on how to forge iron, giving them a large advantage against the rest of the world. This got portrayed in the game by having the rebels dropping bronze weapons while the soldiers of the Empire were dropping iron weapons. And this is 100% true. I did know about a few of these things. I guess I was just lazy, and that's why I lumped in tyranny with all those other games that feel like Baldur's Gate tributes because of their mechanics, and in consequence would appeal, at least in theory, to people who loved Baldur's Gate back in the day. But it's true, the setting absolutely draws inspiration from our own Earthen Bronze Age. In my defense, I will say that I did mention this in an earlier video, the one I made about the policies that I have as a gamer. In that video, I talked about how with Tyranny, I broke the never buy special editions policy, because I bought Tyranny's Overlord edition. Well, in that video, I did say that the game takes place in an age that seems to be in a transition between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. But I thought I'd mention this comment because it is worth more than the entire video. It's informative, it's well written, and it adds to the discussion. Then we have some of your comments about the Archons. We have this one by Dan Burlotos. I'm sure I'm butchering his last name to hell and back, so I'm hoping you'll forgive me for that. He says a few nice things, and thanks a million for that. And then he says, However, your critique on the Archons is interesting. I looked at their failings as the inevitable outcome of winning. When there is no more war, we must make our own. Or even more so, that during the heat of the conflict, it is easy to ignore a friend's failings, only to have them become more unbearable as time goes on, a painful thing in a romantic relationship to realize. The reputation they have as godlike warlords of untold experience, pure propaganda by the Divine Warlord. In my playthrough, it was more or less confirmed that the entire foundation of Kairos' power was a lie. How else to propagate your own domination than to continue and exaggerate that lie when referring to your vassals? All this seems like an extension of an empire is easier to conquer than it is to rule. Okay, let's grab that and store it somewhere for the moment. Now Cool Photon 1234 said this. On the subject of the Archon's behavior, it is heavily implied that their personalities and behaviors can be shaped somewhat by what people believe about them because of the nature of what makes them an Archon. It is a part of why the two youngest Archons, whom have relatively little known about them, are the most flexible, while the oldest tend to be nearly nothing but the embodiment of ideals. It is probably why Kairos herself is so very careful about disseminating solid information about himself, as the less people know for sure about him, the more agency she has. Well, I think that what is common to both of these comments, as well as some others that were far less palatable, let's put it that way, is that those who wrote them are reading a bit too far into the game and are making interpretations about how the Archons are supposed to come off. And I think that because they are smart, I mean, they are subscribers to the channel, so of course they are, and because they probably got very immersed in the game, they tried to fix with their interpretations something that wasn't quite right. And let me tell you why I think this. If you read the short stories that come with the Overlord edition, especially the ones about Barrick's origin and the voices of Narat, you'll notice that these stories are told from the perspective of an omniscient narrator. An omniscient narrator is the all-knowing voice in a story. The narrator has greater insight into the narrative events, context, and the character's motives, unspoken thoughts, and experiences than any individual character does. It is also known as an intrusive narrator, and as such, the narrator in Tyranny is removed from the story. He or she is impervious to propaganda and not susceptible to buying into the world's bullshit, beliefs, tendencies, or anything else, because they are not a part of Tyranny's world. He or she is above all this, and this person paints Graven Ash and the voices of Narat in an epic light. 
which I think is a pretty unequivocal sign that the game pretty much expects us to believe that these people are seasoned war veterans who are meant to come off as larger than life. I also don't think it is propaganda, because that's not a theme the game juggles with, not even slightly. I mean, you do have the disfavored saying Graven Ash protects, but he actually does protect with his magic. If it had been propaganda, we would have seen characters discussing the power of information and mechanics of manipulation, and we don't see that. But I guess that my biggest problem with these guys is not that they are incompetent. My problem is with their demeanor, their attitudes and mindsets. And this is not limited to the Archons. I think the Archons are the biggest example, but other characters in this game have this problem too. And it's that they do not sound like people who are part of an ancient Mediterranean-inspired fantasy world. Their vocabulary and mindsets are more akin to those of someone in their mid-twenties in modern-day Earth. I will always bring out the example of these books. I read these books in the mid-80s, and one thing that absolutely sucked me into their worlds was the way in which characters talked, and how they were culturally nothing like anything or anyone I knew in the real world. But it seems like nowadays there's a portion of the audience who considers those characters who do not talk like present-day people and who do not have the mindset of modern-day people to be cringy, and I think it is the exact opposite. Take for example Stannis Baratheon from A Song of Fire and Dice. Game of Thrones if you will. The guy was stubborn, he was vindictive, he was zealously respectful of the rules. In my opinion, this is how Graven Ash should have sounded and behaved. You can talk all the shit you want about George Martin, and I think he does deserve his fair share of shit, but one thing that you cannot say is that he doesn't know how to write characters who are consistent with the book's lore. Stannis, for example, never came off as a modern day person. Even if you think Stannis is incompetent, his brand of incompetence feels adequately ancient. And that's a problem that I have with modern games as a whole. Sometimes you hear stuff like, cut to the chase and okay in games that take place in ancient fantasy settings. Let's cut to the chase. And I am pretty sure that a Bronze Brotherhood guy in Tyranny also says cut to the chase at some point. That's wrong. Cut to the chase is an expression that originated during the early days of filmmaking, because almost every movie ended with a chase sequence. And that's why cut to the chase became a saying, a way to say, spare me the crap, get to the good part already. And movies aren't a thing in Solasta, so that is an expression that characters shouldn't be saying. I also lost count of how many times people said OK in the Pathfinder games. That idiot Rigongar was easily the worst offender. Listen, I'm not saying that the writing in a video game, of all means, should be true to the way people spoke in the day and age from which the game draws its inspiration, OK? I once picked up a document written in Spanish that had been written 250 years ago, and I didn't understand jack shit of what was written there. But the world you build as a writer, and that includes the way in which people talk, should not feel like the world around you. Not if it draws inspiration from ancient times, and it should definitely not reflect the world we live in today. That's lazy. Step out of your shoes, writers. Do a little bit of research. I'm probably a little bit older than most of the people who are doing the writing these days for TV shows and video games, but some of the things I hear in video games that take place in ancient settings, and some of the mindsets some characters have in these games, sound so modern that they would feel out of place in an 80s film. So you can't imagine how completely out of place this vocabulary and these mindsets are in a medieval fantasy or ancient Rome setting. And I guess that just about ends my rant about the Archons and how I feel about this particular topic of discussion. Then we have the topic of broccoli. MD says, broccoli just needs to be seasoned correctly. It takes five minutes to make broccoli that tastes and feels amazing to eat and goes perfectly with any kind of meat you could pair it up with. People just assume you have to eat bland raw or steamed nonsense, and it's sad. And Ryan Fitzpatrick says, broccoli is a superfood, sir. I'm sure. I'm sure it's superb in terms of its nutritional values and it's super healthy and all. I'll just pass any time I have the chance. And that's it for Tyranny. Let's move on to Expeditions Rome. And we have a juicy one here from good old Ben L, who has been an active subscriber to the channel. Well, I don't know if he's good and old. Maybe he's evil and young. But he sounds like he's good and old. So this is what he had to say. Damn. I'd heard mixed things about this one, so I'd let it pass me by. Well, I'll have to check it out now. 
Anyway, a military historian who specializes in Rome reviewed this game for historical accuracy. My comments with links in them tend to disappear, but if you search a collection of unmitigated pedantry, expeditions Rome and the perils of verisimilitude, you should find it. His verdict was not good. You alluded to some details being different or events happening out of order, but the inaccuracies go much deeper than that. In particular, the way the game depicts Roman warfare and politics bear little resemblance to how those things actually worked. Also, some characters say and do things that are considerably out of character with their historical counterparts, such as Kikero being in favor of representative democracy. So I duly went and checked out this article. The author's name is Brett Devereaux. I'm pretty sure I just butchered his last name. And I think that people who take it upon themselves to point out inaccuracies in movies, TV shows, and games are necessary. Just like those academics who write extensive scientific articles about the unknown virus of unspecified origins to balance out the accepted professional opinions on the topic are needed. Because if nothing else, these historically accurate games and films are good to pique people's interest in actual historical events, settings, and characters, but they are most definitely not to be taken as reliable sources of information. To make the long story short, or as short as stories get in ye old entertainment, Devereaux, Brett, let's call him Brett from now on, Brett talks about a phenomenon that he calls historical verisimilitude, and this is what he says about it. Put bluntly, it has become pretty clear that a veneer of historical accuracy or realism is a valuable marketing tool to set a work apart from the crowd. At the same time, the combination of cheaper CGI and easier online research has made accomplishing this through visual accuracy, making things look right, easier than it has ever been. The result is a lot of pop culture products that at least market themselves as rooted in history from historically placed modern prestige products like HBO's Rome or Netflix Outlaw King to video games like, yes, Expeditions Rome, but also the Assassin's Creed series and Age of Empires, which I actively try to avoid. The danger here, and he uses that word specifically, danger, which is the word that I have a problem with, the danger here is that the effort ends up only skin-deep historical verisimilitude instead of historical accuracy, a product that looks right while being wrong. And this is something that I fundamentally disagree with on many levels. But before I get into the thick of what I think is wrong with this premise, I'd just like to point out that historical accuracy has been a marketing tool long before CGI or the internet even existed. You have Schindler's List, Amistad, Pocahontas, Braveheart, JFK, The Untouchables, Sully, and I could go on forever. And to say that these films took liberties with their stories would be a monumental understatement. So pop culture products that market themselves as rooted in history are not the product of the modern technology or the access to information that makes these products easier to produce nowadays. They have more or less always existed. And I guess that that is an important point to make because my main gripe with this article is that it seems like the point it seeks to make is that the danger that these films and games pose is that people may actually take what they see and experience in these products as an accurate representation of actual historical events. And this is not a danger. Historical verisimilitude is exactly what you need for this historically accurate games. The only thing you need, actually. In Expeditions Rome, the fact that they use the pronunciato restituta whenever they speak Latin, the fact that they pulled out Lucius Licinius Lucullus out of his obscure corner in history, and the fact that weapons like Copeches or Copeshi or Copeches, yeah, the plural form of that shit, and Celtic swords in this game are pretty accurate, add to the immersion aspect of the game. And that's all we need. Listen, it takes only 30 seconds of you playing Hades which is a phenomenal roguelike, by the way. I recommend this to anyone who likes video games. It only takes 30 seconds to know that this game goes on about Greek mythology in a very lighthearted way. The game is almost begging you not to take it seriously, but it is still decently rooted in Greek mythology. Well, I would say that Expeditions Rome is like 10% more serious about its historical accuracy than Hades is about its Greek mythology. And if Bestia's first appearance in the game does not clue you in about the game's tone, I suspect nothing will. In Expeditions Rome, there is a vendor yelling, fresh fish, fresh fish, chips, sold separately. And then you have this conversation. I heard good things about that play. The guy who plays Heracles is gorgeous. I don't know. I didn't like the ending. 
Zeus just steps down from Olympus and fixes everything. It felt a bit pointless. Hey, no spoilers. This game is self-aware and it likes to have fun with itself. Are we to take a shit on it because fish and chips weren't a thing in Troas? Or because people only began using the word spoiler in association with entertainment around the mid-1980s? I don't think so. Ben L. also mentions that Kikero was depicted as a paladin of representative democracy in Expeditions Rome, when he was in fact quite the opposite. And yes, this is true, and I will go even further in support of that thesis. Kikero was all about Roman law, you know, legislating in anticipation of every possible situation. And that's one of ancient Rome's staples, to the point that we still talk about Roman law as opposed to common law or jurisprudence. And yet, Kalia's trial in the game happens in a way that is laughably the exact opposite of how it would have been in ancient Rome by the accounts we have access to. And this is mostly because Kikero, who acts as Kalia's defendant in this trial, is all hell-bent on trying to sway the judge's discretion in a way that befits more a system of common law. He never refers to any piece of written legislation, and that's not a very Kikero thing to do. But should we crap on the game because of this? I don't think so. Now, I get that if the game's marketing revolved around its alleged historical accuracy, it might come off as deceitful when you actually start playing the game. But man, every freaking film, TV show, movie, and novel that has ever claimed that it's being historically accurate is shitting on you. Every one of them. And it has to be that way, because history isn't a story. History does not have plot points, rising actions, or climaxes as we experience them in movies. And real people aren't archetypes, real people have no hero's journey, and so on and so forth. My point is that it is up to the viewer or the player to say, huh, this game was a shitload of fun. Now, let me grab a book or two on the topic to see what actually happened or how things actually were back in the day. And if your answer to this is, yeah, the problem is that most people won't grab a book and they'll just eat up whatever the film or game says, then you and I have a much deeper disagreement and it goes way beyond how stories are told in game. If people won't go and fact check the film, let them not do that then. If they are not interested in looking beyond the Hollywoodized version of things, that's fine. But by all means, write your article or your book calling out the bullshit in these films and games. I'd probably be one of the first to read it. But don't say there is danger or peril in the fantasized depictions of historical events and characters as we see them in games. Now, for those of you who are still watching and are still interested in Expeditions Rome, I will give Brett all the credit in the world for the part of the article in which he actually reviews the game. I'll read the excerpt of the article that I actually agree with. For those looking for a review of the game, mine would run thusly. Expeditions roam as a capable, turn-based tactics RPG hybrid which attempts to use its historical setting to rise above its individual elements, which, though solidly serviceable, are not the best in class. And yes, the best in class are some of the titles he goes on to mention next, like XCOM. But then he goes on to say that the story is not as deep as that in other games. And here's the thing. On an operative level, there are many games that offer better tactical turn-based combat than Expeditions Rome. If that's what you're interested in, you can look into XCOM, XCOM 2, Phoenix Point, which I strongly recommend if this is your jam, and even the third entry in the Shadowrun Return Saga, Shadowrun Dragonfall. But what makes combat stand out in this game is precisely the narrative build-up to every combat encounter. These epic sieges that take place at the end or in the middle of every act are motherfucking epic because of what is at stake in all of them. But as tactical turn-based combat encounters, they are just okay. I don't know if he missed the point, but the story in Expeditions Rome is meant to be a straightforward thrill-written tale of revenge with no embellishments, and as such, I think it absolutely succeeds. This is not meant to be Planescape Torment or Disco Elysium, it's just a solid, lean story that is entertaining and exciting as fuck. Actually, I just finished my second playthrough. It was just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm even more impressed with this game now than I was before because I got a very different ending, which was even more satisfying and badass. So yes, I can only recommend this game despite its many flaws. Moving on to Underrail. I think we are mostly all on the same page with this one, 
I'd just like to mention that no, of course Star Wars A New Hope is not a western film. It's a space sci-fi action film. But there is something intangible about that film that makes it appealing to fans of western films in ways that other films don't. I can't explain, but that seems to be a thing, at least in the universities I've been to. At least amongst teachers from audiovisual subjects. But I am not even going to linger on this because despite the fact that I made it a part of the case that I was making to explain why I feel Underrail might surely appeal to those who loved the original Fallout, I think there's plenty more in that hour-long video that explains on an operative level why I think Underrail is a game that people who liked Fallout are going to like. As for the builds, ah, uh, the builds. I'd like to pull up Chuck Wood's comment. Shout out to Chuck Wood, by the way, for always dropping by and leaving a comment. There is a hard blocker in the second city that determines if you can get to chapter 2. If you don't have a build that can beat a difficult combat dungeon or have the ability to craft dynamite to get around it, well, tough luck. I guess you have to restart. It gets even worse if you play with a trinket experience mode. He's referring to the oddity system, because that means you can't grind respawning enemies to get to higher levels. There might be other ways to get through, but I have not played this game for several years, so I don't remember. There might be ways to chase the combat encounters there, but again, I don't remember. Well, I guess that where I stand in the build discussion, which goes way beyond Underrail and how builds work in that game, can best be explained with the difference between efficacy and efficiency as it is understood in the realms of engineering. Efficacy is getting shit done, okay? And efficiency is getting shit done in the best possible way using the minimum amount of resources, doing it in less time or with less effort, okay? If you can get the job done, if with your build you can win fights, if you can beat the game in a difficulty level in which builds matter, then your build is effective. It may or may not be also efficient, but it is at least effective. Now, if your build allows you to kill the final boss in Underrail in one turn, well, first, fuck you, and second, your build is efficient. So there is a lot of nuance and subtext here. I think that games like Underrail and Pathfinder Kingmaker, or Wrath of the Righteous for that matter, are not good games for people who have not played any or few RPGs before. Because beginners tend to not want to neglect any attribute or any aspect of their character. They tend to have the aspiration to balance their characters or to make them a jack of all trades because they don't want to miss out on any part of the content and these games will fuck you in the ass while they say who's your daddy if you do this. This is also true of Divinity Original Sin 2 or Expeditions Viking. So I think that when we talk about Underrail and the builds that you can go for in this game, it is safe to discount the beginner approach, okay? Underrail isn't for beginners. This game is not, I think, for people who want to bypass the action to get straight to the story bits, it's just not. So I think that saying that Underrail is build dependent because making a jack of all trades or spreading your points too thinly at the time of your character creation doesn't work is not correct. I think we kind of have to assume that no one's gonna do that. So if you have some idea of how to play these games, because you have played Fallout, Fallout New Vegas, Wasteland, the original Shadowruns, and even medieval fantasy RPGs like the Baldur's Gates and Icewind Dales, you are probably going to come up with a build that is at least effective. Perhaps not efficient, but effective. I think Underrail is a game in which you can make many effective builds. If you're not a beginner, there is a very good chance that with your build, you'll be able to finish the game, even in dominating. I will admit that I don't know if this is true of the oddity system. I played on Classic, so I don't know if playing the game and dominating the oddity system flattens efficiency and efficacy. I personally don't like games that do this. So subscriber Lulals, shout out to Lulals also for always dropping by and leaving a comment, asked this just recently. Would you recommend going through a guide on underrail character creation or just following the basic principles like building synergies and not spreading the talent points too thinly in many areas will do the trick? Do it, man. Wing it. Play that thing however you want to play it. That's where the fun is to be had. And listen, I get it. I recommended Tainted Grail Conquest without reservations, and some of you said, are you fucking shitting me, this game is ridiculously hard. And I probably wasn't taking into account that I have a few hundred hours of experience in Gwent Online, physical or real-life Magic the Gathering, and most importantly Slay the Spire, which is where Tainted Grail Conquest got its card mechanics from. 
And if you don't have this experience, yes, this game will probably crush you. When you are recommending games, sometimes it is not easy to evaluate how much of an impact your previous experience with similar titles is adding or taking away from your enjoyment of the game. Recommending games is a bit harder than it seems, I think. Speaking of previous experience, shout out to those who recommended Battle Brothers and Vagras. You guys rock. Some of you should seriously think about starting your own channels. Tell me if you're going to do this. So yeah, builds is probably the thing that you guys and I don't see eye to eye about, but that's all right. Let me know if you enjoyed this video format. I enjoyed it a lot. I hope that at some point we can have these conversations live. Well, of course, let me know if you'd be interested in this. Maybe you say, nah, listening to this as a podcast while I do some other shit is something that I can do, but I won't have a conversation live at a certain time on Discord. I'm just too fucking old for that. And well, I would totally get that. In any case, thank you for dropping by. Never stop gaming, guys. And I'll be reading you soon. Bye, everyone.